in when you were 18. 18 months old. You were 18 months old. Yes, I was born in Tallahassee, Alabama. And at that time, uh, uh, people, women had their children at home, and I had a, my mother had a, a midwife, and my birth was recorded in the Bible. But the Bible got lost, so they had no record of me being born in Tallahassee, Alabama. My father moved our family here to uh, Dayton, Ohio. I was 18 months old. So now, in order to, uh, to let the people know that I do exist, I had to get my older sister to uh, get my birth recognized here in Dayton, Ohio, as being born here in Dayton, Ohio on Fifth Street and got it notarized and I'm considered a Buckeye, but really I'm not. I was born in Tallahassee, Alabama. Wow, wow. So back in 36, 1936, uh, moving up here, was there any impetus that caused your family to want to leave the South? Yes. In that time, you know, the South were, was really, uh, they had slaves and uh, the white people, you had to live on their plantation and do their work. And uh, my mom uh, and my dad, they raised chickens. So one day uh, uh, the chickens got loose and went over in Mr. Sutter's yard. He, he was a white uh, family next door. And, he told my mom that if she didn't move them chickens, he was going to kill them. And my mother pulled a shotgun on him and told him if she, he killed any of her chickens, that uh, he, he would be dead. So uh, when my father came home, she told my father about it. And daddy knew that we had to leave because they would, you know, do something to the family. And uh, so... Uh, my dad who took our family down to my grandmother's house for us to stay, and he hoboed on a train to uh, Ohio, got to Dayton, Ohio. And the first time he got here, he got his first job at, uh, at the Sebo Foundry, and the first paycheck he got, he sent back and, and got my mother and, and my other siblings and moved us to Dayton, Ohio, where he was. Wow. So there were still slaves in the 30s? Not slaves, but it was just like they were slaves. They had the work, the uh, plantation, picking cotton, which they only got paid once a year. And at the end of the year, uh, the, the people would say, well, you just broke even. They wouldn't pay them. They had to uh, get, take their pay out in food, in flour, and meal, and, and uh, things of that nature. They never got paid for it. Wow. They're just like slavery. Interesting. So coming up here then with your father, you, your family, your mom and sisters joining your father up here, up north, land of the free, yeah. home of the brave. brave. Well, tell, tell me something about that. Like, what was it like growing up in Dayton, Ohio, in the... 40s and 50s? Well, I tell you, it was really segregated here. Uh, Dayton, actually, Dayton is one of the, is number 16 in the nation of one of the most segregated cities in the nation. Day Dayton was uh, really segregated. Um, I remember an incident uh, when we lived on uh, Western Avenue. Uh, which is now James H. McGee. But during that time, Roosevelt High School was very segregated. They had uh, a swimming pool for the blacks and one for the whites. And they didn't allow, uh, blacks weren't allowed across Third Street because the hunkies lived on the other side. Then we called them hunkies because they lived on the other side. And they had a, a, a cafe that only the teddies could go into the hunkies. So one day uh, a black young lady went in there and they jumped on her and beat her up. 
When she came back home at that time, they had a, a gang known as the West Side, the Western Gang, and they were some bad dudes. The West Side Gang? Yeah. So when they, she came back and told them, they went back up on Third Street, and it was a mess. The the blacks and the hunkies got to fighting. You know them hunkies can fight too, but they were no match for them blacks. They tore it up on Third Street, and at the corner it was a drugstore where they didn't allow blacks to go in and eat. And don't you know, uh, it almost was a race riot, and before they, after uh, that Western gang got through, we could go in and eat at that drugstore. And not only that, they closed down the Teddy Bear uh, Cafe. And then we had business downtown with Wright's. Wright's was segregated. It was a store that did not have, uh, hire blacks. Okay. We spent our money there, show. At that particular time, we had a, uh, a black uh, person uh, in the Macintosh. He was our leader. He, he organized us. We marched. We went down there. Macintosh, Jesse Gooding, myself, and uh, I was about uh, 12 of us was going down in rights. And we had Miss Francis, uh, who was a black realtor that had the money. <laughs> she was the one who was going to bail us out of jail because we know we were going to jail. So when we got down in rights, McIntosh Sumter was his name, confronted the manager and wanted to know, uh, wanted them to hire some blacks. Uh, down in rights, and of course the manager, uh, they got in the argument and the police was called and the paddy wagon came and took all of us to, to jail. <laughs> but you know what? We got on the phone and Miss Francis and, and uh, at that time George Tuck, uh, a black uh, person that had money, they came down and they bailed us out. But after that, they hired blacks in rights, you know. Wow, so all of your protesting over the years paid off. Oh, yes, it did. So you have the incident at the Teddy Cafe, then you have <laughs> rights. Right. Tell me a little about the encounter you had with W.S. McIntosh on the bus. Was it called the RTA then? Yeah, it was RTA, and that was during a time when they didn't hire black drivers. They had white salt. But anyway, you now Macintosh was a bad boy. Now, that was a, a <laughs> this this white man got on the bus, and he was intoxicated and. Uh, he was uh, using all kinds of uh, uh, languages, uh, foul language, and then there were women, black women on the bus, and uh, something, Macintosh got him and said, look here, man, said, you can't talk like that. We, we have our black uh, young ladies on the bus. You got to respect them. And uh, he reared up and <laughs> had... Macintosh and Buddy, that was the wrong thing to do. Macintosh politely leaded him to the back door and kicked him off the bus. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What did the bus driver do? Uh, the bus driver didn't say nothing because <laughs> he didn't want he didn't want Macintosh. He had to answer to him. You know, he just he just kept on starting the bus back up and kept on driving. <laughs> Interesting. So you were writing the same cohort with Macintosh and name some other leaders that were around that time. Well, there was uh, Macintosh and then Jesse Gooden was his, was his right hand man. Okay. Jesse Gooding, Leela Francis. Um, oh, there were, I can't recall all of them, but there were a lot of them. You you guys know, as a matter of fact, you're in a bit, but 
you, you need to get that out there because we were pioneers. See, uh, you guys wouldn't be enjoying what you enjoy not had it not been for us. Yep. I agree. So who, if you had to name someone, who would you say was the most impactful leader during those 50s, 60s, and 70s, the very tumultuous time of civil rights in Dayton, Ohio? I would say Sumter McIntosh, Jesse Gooding, of course yours truly, Isabel Moore, uh, Leela Francis, George Tuck, uh, Floyd uh, Johnson. We were teachers and we taught at Edison School also. Uh, Floyd and I ran for state representative in the 38th district then. Then there was C.J. McGlynn Sr. He was the cause of C.J. McGlynn Jr. Uh, becoming the first state representative. And, um, oh, there were uh, Miley Williamson of the NAACP. Uh, there were a number of, of, of people I can't recall all of the names, but certainly I want you guys to go ahead and do the history so that our youngsters be aware of the pioneers of black history. Then, of course, you had the Lyndon Center, which is I'm very much concerned about. They've closed that down, and that shouldn't be because that was the only recreation center that blacks had on uh, West Dayton, it has a swimming pool, a basketball court, and that's where we got all of our famous uh, basketball players. Uh, that won the state championship in 1949 when Frederick C. McFarland was the first black principal of Denver High School. That's where all our famous uh, basketball players came from. They learned right at the Linden Center, and that should be reopened with the five million and a half dollars that they've allotted to West Dayton to repair West Dayton. We want to make sure that they use that money to repair West Dayton. I agree. So is there anything else that you would like to share with us today? No, uh, right now, except that uh, I think uh, Central State is doing a beautiful job. I'm alumni, so is Floyd Patterson, you guys. And I thank you, I wanna commend you on, I'm so thankful that God uh, has uh, gotten you, Kenya, Baker, and uh, the others to lead a committee to do what you're doing now because certainly I want our generation coming in to know about the black history of West Dayton. It has not always been a West Dayton. I agree. Well, we thank you for your time, and we look forward to working with you in the future and seeing you at this year's Black Culture Festival. I certainly will be there. The pleasure will be mine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Today, Ms. Peters. Well, thank you for the invitation. How are you feeling? I'm feeling blessed. Excellent. You look when you hit 83, you feel blessed. 
83? Mm -hmm. Wow, that is a blessing. <laughs> so you're a very popular historian here in the Dayton area. Well, thank you. And your popularity is greatly honored due to your writing. Right. You've written multiple historical texts. Yes that have documented the history of blacks in Dayton, right? and specifically blacks. Is there any reason why you focused on blacks <laughs> in Dayton? Well, as a black person living in Dayton, um, that's my experience. My parents were from Virginia and West Virginia. Um, my mother was from Virginia, which had been a slave state. So it was very segregated. The schools for black students stopped at the seventh grade. So her parents worked and saved enough money to send her to Dayton, where she lived with her aunt, Gertrude Elliott, who had married a Dayton police officer. And she then went to Roosevelt High School. So we, of course, went to Roosevelt. Walked right past Dunbar every day to go to Roosevelt. Now my father was from West Virginia, which was a free state, settled by people who, many of them left old Virginia because they did not believe in slavery. So he was able to go to college um, served in World War, served in the war, and uh, was an excellent architect. In the book, you see photographs of some of the homes in the Dayton area that he designed and built. And we used to go out and sometimes and watch him build a house. And that was, you know, a wonderful experience to see your father start from nothing and build a home. Wow. You know, he did a lot of remodeling on our home, you know, put extra bedrooms in, and, as the family expanded. Right. And, uh, he was a trustee at Zion Baptist Church. And his business card said, J.A. Peters, builder homes, not houses. Mm -hmm. Very exacting. You know, he had a young man working with him and the guy did some work that was like an eighth of an inch off. He tore it out and redid it correctly. Wow. So. Wow, that's, that's some interesting family history that oh, you yeah. have. Mm -hmm. And so you went to Roosevelt as well? Oh, yes, we went through all of, all, I have four brothers and sisters, all of us went to Roosevelt because our mother had gone to Roosevelt when she came here from Virginia because the school was. So we would walk past Dunbar every day <laughs> to go to Roosevelt because that's where she went. Is it true that they had a separate pool for the black children? No. No, n no, not when you were there? No, not when I was there. That's so, one of those myths that pop up and it's so hard to get rid of. Oh, really? Yeah, when I went there, uh, Jean Daly Booker was the gym teacher. And she would not have put up with that nonsense. Oh, really? She was against oh, yeah. racism? And oh, yeah. And the title of our civil rights recognition ceremony is Blessed Are Those Who Struggle. Mm -hmm. Did you experience struggle growing up in Dayton? Um, I didn't experience struggle because I was black. I lived in Edgemont uh, on 246 Homestead Avenue. It was a predominantly black. There were a few white families still there. They had not moved out yet. Um, I had all white teachers at Irving, and I remained friends with them as I got older. At Roosevelt, I had all white, friend, all white teachers, <laughs> and with some of them, like Jean Booker, I remained friends throughout her lifetime. When my nephew, Dayton Police Officer Kevin Brain, was shot and killed, Miss Booker was one of the people who came by the house to comfort my mother. And as she got older and was ill and in the nursing home, we would go out to visit Jean Daly Booker. You know, so Roosevelt was a very close-knit school when I was there. Well, you write a lot about Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Oh, yes. And I know that Paul Lawrence Dunbar had issues with employment because of his color. Yes, I mean, he graduated like top of his class, you know, but couldn't get a job on the paper. No. And so he, he became, became an ele elevator operator. An elevator operator mm -hmm. with a college degree? Oh, high school. High school degree. Mm -hmm. But, but the top of the class. But the top of the class. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the Wright brothers gave him a chance. Oh, yeah. 
Well, him and the Wright brothers were very, very close. And uh, because he was riding in the elevator, he was able to share his writing with the people who rode with him. And that's how some people became aware of what a genius he was, you know, Joe Chunat. So even adverse circumstances can lead to good things sometimes. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. What would you like to share with us for this ceremony? Did you know McIntosh personally? Yes, I knew uh, Debbie McIntosh very well. Very well. He was a, a good man, um, one who was not concerned about his own building wealth or becoming famous, but who went out and walked regardless of the weather in order to get what a lot of us just take for granted now. You know, we take it for granted that we can buy a house wherever we want to. You know, we can get a job if we're qualified for it. But that wasn't true for Mr. McIntosh. I mean, I remember him, you know, walking the streets, uh, trying to get people to work with him. And, you know, some did and others didn't. But, you know, we owe a lot to, to Mr. McIntosh. And I think the generation now, we just know there's a park named after him, right. but don't really know the background right. and why, why we named why the park named the after park. him. Well, that's our fault, the fault of everybody who knew Mr. McIntosh and knew what he did for not sharing that story. You know, we are a people who always shared our story orally. And just because we now, you know, got cameras and all this other stuff, we still need to talk to our children, our grandchildren, and let them know that these things that they take for granted, somebody went out and walked the streets, somebody lost their job, other people lost their lives, mm -hmm. for what you take for granted. But I, if we don't tell them, they're not going to know it. I hear a lot about people going to jail. Oh, yeah. D did you experience any of that? No. No, I did not experience when Jim going to jail. Most of my protests were in the form of writing, speaking, and I guess they figured they didn't want me in jail. It would be too much publicity, so. <laughs> That's understandable. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, what else could you share with us today that you believe, you say that the stories have been um, neglected to be told. So if you were to tell a story that you feel should have been told, mm. what story would you tell? Well, one of the people that I think has not really been appreciated for what he actually did is Paul Orange Dunbar. Because as soon as you mention Dunbar, a lot of people think only of his dialect poetry. Dialect poetry is beautiful, and that's the way that some of us spoke. But Dunbar was a man who worked with Dr. W. E. Du Bois. Dunbar was a man who wrote beautiful, beautiful standard English poetry. Uh, his Ode to Ethiopia is marvelous. You know, he talks about, O oh, mother race, to thee I bring this pledge of faith unwavering. He talks about the struggles that our people have gone through. And so we're still going through struggles. So when I teach or speak, I still use Dunbar because people need to know that he wrote more than lies, lies, best be long. He wrote his Ode to Ethiopia, poem of praise to black people. Mm. And, you know, we need to know that. We, know, we need to know that he worked with Dr. W. E. B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington. I mean, his life should be a model for us. This is a man who's one generation out of slavery. Okay. And yet he accomplished all of that. And if he could do all of that, go to England and be honored. Yeah. Okay, the first state memorial in the country honoring a black person honors Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And we have people in Dayton, black people, who have never been to the Dunbar house, which is a disgrace. This is a man who struggled, this is a man who wrote this is a man who honored his people, who honored us, and the least we can do is go to his house. You know, we had our, uh, I served as president of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, the Dayton branch. And when we had our national convention here, 
the one place that most people wrote down they enjoyed visiting was the Dunbar House. These were people from states all across the country and a couple from Africa. And they were thrilled to have the chance to go to the Dunbar House. Mm -hmm. And we have people in Dayton who walk past the Dunbar House and who have never been there. I mean, <laughs> I mean that's, that's unfortunate. They should go. This is a man whose parents were slaves. And look what he did with the talent God gave him. So yeah. I'm appealing to my audience. If you have not been to the Dunbar House, please go. You know, the state keeps track of how many people go to these different places. So by going to the Dunbar House, we not only enrich ourselves by learning more about him, but we encourage support of the Dunbar House. So that's my, that's my pitch for today. Go to the Dunbar House and go back and go back. Yeah. I was recently there for Ancestors Day and it was really nice. Oh, isn't it beautiful? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, and to think, you know, this is a man one genera generation out of slavery. Yeah. And he used his talent to buy that house. So living in such a tumultuous time that Dunbar and yourself lived in and now today, what would be your analysis of where we are today as blacks in Dayton and what we need to do to either rectify or continue on the path mm -hmm. as those who continue to struggle? Right. Right, because, you know, somebody once said, you know, the struggle continues, and it does. So one of the things that I always recommend to people is that they become part of an organization that is actively working to improve our condition. You know, you automatically think of the NAACP, but there's also the Urban League, there's the SCLC, and these are the churches. Many of them have strong civil rights activities. There's, join your PTA. Know what's going on in the school that your child is going to because uh, schools react when the community becomes involved. So that's another way that we can have some real impact. Okay. Uh, if you have children, grandchildren, be sure that you share your family story with them because your story is part of black history. Uh, when we have our ASLH meetings, one of the things that we do is ask people how it is that you happen to live here in Dayton. And we would get these stories of what it was like, you know, where their grandparents or great-grandparents lived and how that encouraged them to come to Dayton so they would have more opportunities. And that we need to share our story, you know, get them written down. Otherwise, they'll be lost. That, that's one of the things we need to do, become part of an organization Okay, you've got the NAACP, you've got the SCLC, you've got the Urban League. All of these are organizations that are working to help us really have the rights, exercise the rights that we have as American citizens. You know, our, our ancestors earned those rights. And, you know, I always used to tell my students that if they did not vote when they turned 18, I come back and haunt them. Our people died for the right to vote. Yeah. And we've got able-bodied black people who don't even have the gumption to get out and vote for people who are going to control their lives. That's a disgrace, a disgrace for any black person not to vote who can vote. I agree. That's my lecture for today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us? Uh, simply to encourage all adults to encourage our young people to read. I know that this is a generation that is used to watching things, but there's a lot in books that you cannot get by watching TV or listening to videos. So please read. There's a reason why it was illegal for a black person to learn to read. Because they knew that there is knowledge in those books and there's power. Knowledge is power. 
You've got to learn as much as possible and use it to benefit our people. This is a book that I wrote for uh, Johnson Publishers, and it is the story, our story here in Dayton, going back to the arrival of the first black people, then going chronologically through the different time periods, those who served in the various wars that we were involved in, those who were educators, those who were scientists, um, those who were artists, and those who simply raised good, strong families. So we encourage, and of course on the cover you have Mac Ross, um, who was one of the Tuskegee Airmen, okay, uh, Daytonian. And people are always amazed when they read through this and find out what black people in Dayton have accomplished. You know, they simply don't know whether it was in education or science or art. I mean, we've got an internationally known artist here in Dayton, in Bing Davis, who could have set up his shop any place. People offer him money, but he chose to stay in Dayton. You know, so we just encourage people to look around Dayton and see people who are making contributions, support those people. Um, we thank all those parents who are struggling many times to give their children a good start. We thank the teachers, many of whom work <laughs> long hours and for oh, yeah. overtime for no overtime pay in order to help our young people. And we need to do that. You know, when we were in Africa, we were a tribal people. Yeah. And the tribe gave you support. Okay, now our tribe is bigger, but we still need each other. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs>say I really got involved in 62 when I was discharged from the military um, I'd gone to Central State University but go back a little further at Roosevelt High School the largest high school in the city of Dayton with about 2,000 students mm. I had gone to segregated schools in Mississippi mm. a segregated elementary school here in Walkman School here in Dayton mm. And so we had good teachers in the segregated school. Then I went to Roosevelt in, six, in 53, and they had everything. They had machine shop, wood shop, all the things that you need. They're very well equipped schools. But even though it was an integrated school, we were segregated inside the school. So I'm 45, so I hear the word segregation all the time, but it's just a word, it kind of means separated, but I have no idea, like, visually what that was like. So when you say segregated and you had a great school, what does that, what does great school mean? Was it an all-black teachers? Great school means that they had the equipment, they had the qualified instructors, that's a great school. Okay. Even though we were in the building, we were not integrated, we were segregated. Now, they didn't have to do too much to segregate us because mentally, We'd grown up knowing our place. It was called Jim Crow. Mm. So mentally, I'm in a Jim Crow situation, but my daddy comes from Mississippi, believed that the white man's ice was colder. Mm. And so he wanted me to go to Roosevelt. Mm. And so I was there at Roosevelt. Um, I benefited better than the regular students because I was an athlete. Oh. And young black men who were athletes, they treated us different. Basketball? Basketball, 
football track, four letter man. All right. Was, uh, <clears throat> so they treated us even, I didn't realize it, but I was getting good grades, but I wasn't doing good race work. Mm. Until I graduated and went to Central State and flunked English. <laughs> One of my friends who's, she's 80 now, she likes to tell everybody, she came a year behind me and she said, you were still taking freshman English when I got there. But the black teachers wanted to teach us something. I had never experienced that. Mm. I experienced just getting a good grade. So the one teacher, Mrs. Dwyer, who was my English teacher, she liked to put a hand in my face and rub on. She wore a little tight skirt. You know, now, I, looking back over the situation, she was probably trying to flirt with the young black athletes. Is but this I, at Central? At, at Roosevelt. Oh, at Roosevelt. No, at Central State, they were serious. Mm. And I, so I joined the NAACP college branch at Central State. Oh, okay. And uh, didn't know really what I was doing. Just get, they, I wanted to be involved in everything. What attracted you to the NAACP? Because uh, my dad would never tell me about his life in Mississippi until I was old enough to drive and I drove him back to Mississippi because I was ashamed of my father because mm. my father couldn't read. Mm. So when I was driving down the highway, he said, what's that sign say? I said, he said, Lexington, what's that sign say? I said, oh, he didn't take us back because he couldn't read. And then he took me across a bridge in Monroe, Mississippi, and he loosened up, he relaxed, and he said, uh, you know, a black man came back from World War I. They hung him off the bridge because he had a military uniform on. And I said, wow, my dad had seen something. Then he went on down the road, he told me other incident. I said, no wonder he's scared of these people. These people are crazy. Right, and you were in college at that time. I was in college, yes. Yes, I was, I was in college, like getting the maturity and, and, and you know, really wanting to see the world and yeah. driving and that kind of stuff. So I was in college because I was so, you know, I'd hitchhike anywhere, you know. So anyway, my father, being afraid of white people, and I hated him, he was as big as I am then. And I said, how could this big man be scared of them little white guys? You know what I'm saying? I could not, it don't, it's a little so I wanted to correct that situation. He was very scared for me. Mm. Every time we pick it, he said, okay, that was good. Okay, but let somebody else do it next time. You pick, you, you were picketing when you were with the college in NAACP? Yes, we were picking. That was simple stuff like trying to make white people cut our hair. Hmm. That didn't make sense to me now. But we went over to Yellow Springs and we picketed a guy over there because he wouldn't cut black hair. We picketed Guy's Market in 1957 in Zinia because when we went to town, they spit in your, your food because they didn't want us eating at that. And so we picked it. And so when the faculty found out that the NXCP was picketing, they said, uh oh, we can really get in trouble because Green County is one of the most conservative counties in the state of Ohio. So what they did is, well, okay, we're going to march on Zinga. So he lined all the students up. They walked us all the way down the three miles. We looped around Zinga and they marched us right back to campus and they went to was taught and and I thought I said we just got played. <laughs> this is one of the deans did that. And I said, that's the way I so I said, well, we can't uh, achieve this within the structure of the college because these people want to keep their job. Mm. Then we started inviting speakers in. Stokely would come in. Stokely Stokely Carmichael. Okay. And once he makes his little speech, this is all illegal because the campus college did not allow, they didn't sponsor something. We were had an organization called Unity for Unity. Mm -hmm. Now that's a little bit more militant than NAACP. Like Black Panther Party? Kind of like the forerunner to the Black Panther Party. Oh, really? Unity and put our, we put for our Unity. Paper on, yeah, so Stokely came in, he would speak. And then afterward, we had these long, just like we do now after the meeting, we had this long conversation with Stokely, with a sociology instructor named Ames Chapman, and uh, Chapman and Austin, who should have been known, should have been teaching us that, 
what Stokely was talking about. Mm. And then, you know, then they put question marks out, you know, Stokely working for the CIA and so forth. And I said, but wait a minute. You don't know that. The professors will say that? Yeah. Mm. He, he probably went to the CIA. Then, so what, whenever you notice is whenever a militant comes to speak, they bring a good guy in. And they brought Martin Luther King in mm. to speak to us. And he was a preacher. So you bring somebody else like H. Rap Brown in, they bring somebody else like uh, the guy that's retired. Now, he's not retiring now, but he's still in Congress. Uh, but he used to be head of SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, John Lewis, to, you know, to neutralize. When, when uh, Malcolm X went and visited all the countries in Africa, they sent Jesse Jackson behind. Hmm. That's the way, that's the way it works. That's the model for people. That's why when I, I listen to people, like, we're going to get some money. That first time I said this thing, how much money? I said, money, that's the easiest thing for me to do, give you some money. And I, I say that because I took the money too. So I want to fast forward to that. So you've worked with the college level NAACP, graduated from college, came uh, back to Dayton? Right. Oh, yeah, I, I went to my military because I didn't have any money. Right. I don't even know how I paid to get through Central State by hook or crook. But once my daddy hated the military. He did not want me to go to the military. Hmm. But as a sophomore, if you go on advanced ROTC, hmm. you get $52 a month. I said, hey, now I got some money coming in. So I went to advanced ROTC. When you graduate from Central, they put bars on your shoulder, and now I'm a second lieutenant. But what they had, the master plan was to train young black officers to send to Vietnam. I know that now, <clears throat> but again, I didn't know. So they sent me to infantry, Fort Benning, Georgia. Some guys went to armor, some, you know, whatever their aptitude was. But I guess I was an infantry person. So I went to, to Fort Benning, did my thing, and I came home. They offered me $10,000 to stay in. Is that about, we're not in 70 yet. Oh no, this is still in the 60s. So almost the height of civil rights and yeah. black men coming out of college were being programmed, programmed to the right, bribed by money. Cause by money, and it wasn't $50, $52 a month. But when you're mm -hmm. broke, it, right. I mean, I had a lot of girlfriends <laughs> on the first of the month, about three days to my money. <laughs> So your money ran so out. So money ran out. So, you know. so then I'm, I'm bringing you back to Dayton because yeah. that's where the work was, right? Yeah. When I left the military, I came home, of course, couldn't get a job. So I worked as a caseworker for the Montgomery County Welfare Department. Oh, okay. Where was that located at that time? On Sears Street. Okay. And Sears. We, I had 349 cases, and my job was Ooh. to go and look at a house and see if there was a man up under the bed. That was your job? My job was to make sure that the women didn't have no man mm. in the house. Now, you know if they got five babies, there's a man somewhere. What, that sounds, it almost sounds like methodical, like that they wanted the family, the, the family to be broken. Here you have these black people that are coming from like the great migration, right? right Moving right, right. north for freedom. And right. then they need some support before they get on their feet. So right. they go to the welfare office, but your family's got to be separated in order for the... Right, right. But that's, that, that's a black male and female issue because the man, the, the uh, young female, she could get money without him, really. Yeah. And that kind of undermined him. Whereas in Mississippi, my daddy provided for his family. Wow. He worked and picked, you know, the cotton mills right. and all that other stuff, but he brought money home. My mother cooked and fed us. But when I came here, welfare was the thing. So was there welfare there? I mean, did they have that, those type of... I don't you know, I know they had welfare in Mississippi, but I do not recall it because it wasn't in my neighborhood. Everybody, the men worked in my neighborhood. Interesting. So I'm looking at this, evaluating, I'd have gone through college, I, I really, now I'm really getting into black history. Right. Uh, realizing that we had been 
my father had been undermined, but he legitimately had, when I saw that place where that man had been hung off the bridge, that was only about 15 miles from Philadelphia, Mississippi, where during the height of the Civil Rights Movement, back about 63, they uh, buried Serena, Goodman, and Cheney, two Jewish boys, and a black guy who was a SNCC in Jackson, Mississippi, and they were up in close to Tupelo, and they just went out to register people to vote and never came back. I think it took five years before they pulled the, the van out, the, out of the mud where they buried them. Wow. It's some mean dogs. You're talking about guerrilla warfare? It is a mean thing to black people. They'd always ask me when I was interviewed about it, are you angry? And I'd lie and say, oh no. I want to flip the chair over then. Yeah, because you had a, a fairly, at the height of your career, you had a fairly conservative role as the president of the NAACP? No, that's way late. You're, you're talking about 2004. That's late. This is, that's why I say when, when I hear people talking about the L. Jackson, they came after the, the bitter clubs. They, they, they came during a time when the government was buying people. The Billy Clubs? That, yeah. If you're marching, they would come in with the Billy Club and hit you in your head. So you had to do some marching in Dayton? Yes. We, we, our thing was to integrate downtown because downtown, the theaters, you have to go upstairs, segregate it. Mm. Our theater was Rico on the west side. And we call it Rico Rats because the rats would run across the feet. But downtown, they had a nice theater, kind of like the Victoria nowadays. The Victoria Park is one of them, uh, but the Lowe's and the Keith, those, you, you don't even see those names anymore. And you couldn't sit where everyone- You had everyone, to go in and go upstairs. You had to go upstairs, so you all picketed. We picketed to desegregate that. Did it work? Yeah, it worked. We shut time. I mean, we, you know- It, it, uh, it worked? It worked. How many, when you say picketed, was, was it 10 of you, 20? We'd all, we, meet, we met every Thursday on the corner of 5th and Conover in, a, in a, a large building that was owned by one of the, the uh, Masonic orders, and they let us use that building. White? Black? Black. Oh, downtown? Yeah. In West Dayton. Oh, in West Dayton is where you met? Conover Street is, um, you're not from Dayton. Because if I said that, you would know what I'm talking about. I've been in Dayton since I was seven. I moved okay. here from Detroit well, when I was seven. That's like, that's Fifth Street. Okay. You know Fifth, Fifth Street. Street. Yeah, you don't really know. So you can't even imagine Fifth Street because they don't throw all that out. <laughs> no, I can't imagine, but I've heard stories about theaters oh, yeah. and yeah. grocery stores. I mean, everything and anything you needed in Dayton, you could get it on West Fifth. On Fifth Street type. Back here from Detroit, right? Yes. Uh, the fifth Street was Woodward Avenue. Woodward, okay. <laughs> now you know where Fifth Street was. <laughs> so, when, so when you say we met, you still, I still really want to get to that point because yeah. you're talking about changing the status quo of segregation in downtown Dayton. There you go. Was it 10 of you meeting every Thursday? Was it No, 15? we have about 30, 35 people. 35. Do you feel like that was a significant number? Apparently, you yeah. were able to impact and cause change. So right. 35 people made a difference. Yeah, and the leader at that time was W.S. McIntyre. Okay. And there's the, always a The park's named after him, right? McIntosh? Yes, yes. But they never would have named a park after him because he was confronting them. You don't get parks named after you confront Yeah, them. that always, that perplexes me. First off, until working on this project, I never even realized why the park was named McIntosh. I didn't know who he was. But then to find out he was a civil rights leader, it amazes right. me that they right. named a park after him. Right. Well, see, so... Mac would leave the meeting, then we split. As black people, we all, whenever we work together, we always split. The educated people, like, we, I got my college degree. Right, and right? went to the military. Now you got the street people. That's what Mac's talking about, the people who throw the rock. Mm -hmm. They're there. Um. So Mac was with the street people, and we were with the educated people, right? Okay. So eventually, some of the bright pat guys that worked the right pat and had the GS 20s and 15s. I think what we should do is split. So we formed an organization called the Dayton Alliance for Racial Equality. A Dayton Alliance for Racial Equality. That was right over across the street. There? In West Dayton mm -hmm. on Edison and Broadway. That's where our office home was. Hmm. We left Mac 
because when we left him, that, the, the money went with us because we had money in our pocket because we had a job. Mm -hmm. But the grassroots, they didn't have no money. Do you think so, it was a good idea to split? No, it was now hindsight. 2020, right? Yeah. So we, you know, the middle class is really always the one who leads the revolution. You know, they, they, they actually, but the people who do the fighting, that's the grassroots. The grassroots. They're the, they're the ones that burn the buildings down. So McIntosh didn't continue to work with you when you got with Dare? He would talk to us, but he, he was operating his own thing. There are good things, and I'll just keep the, I'm going to stay on the positive side with Okay. Mac. All right? So that's pretty much what we did. We, so CORE, that, that organization that I'm talking about is called the Congress of Racial Equality mm. that we met at the Elard. Mm. We are affiliated with the National Organization of CORE, kind of like the NAACP. We had to pay conference claims. Mm. So whatever money that we collected from membership, we had to split it with the national office. If you don't pay your conference claim, you lose your franchise. Mm. We had McIntyre invited C.J. McLean Sr. Okay. And then had a partner named, uh, we called him Brother James, but his name was Harold Wright. Mm. And Harold Wright knew Mahalia Jackson. You ever heard of her? The singer. Yeah. They, we brought Mahalia Jackson to Dayton. Wow. Pat. The high school stadium. I bet. But we never got a financial report. <laughs> well, <laughs> who was in charge of the money? Mac and, uh, McMahon Senior. McLean Senior. So he comes to the meeting and give his financial report. He said, Oh, Miss Jones, you ain't got your report in. Floyd, y'all got ten tickets. You ain't got your tickets in. We can't get our report if these people don't get the money and the tickets in. And then we dismiss the meeting. That went on maybe about two or three months, and then we maybe got, you figure, $5 times 11,000 people. We maybe got $2,300 or something out of the whole deal. Wow. That's what happens to organizations. That's why when you start talking about the money, it, it always, it's always an issue. Yeah. Okay? So we couldn't pay our conference claim, so we lost our franchise with CORE. So we became there. Dayton Alliance for Racial Equality. Mac called himself the American Freedom Movement. Uh, Mac moved his headquarters over on Third Street. Mac's headquarters was here. The Black Panther Party's headquarters was here. The FBI was in the second floor with cameras looking out, watching them every day. What? The yeah. FBI? The FBI, yeah. You all were doing positive impact work. Right. So what, why was the FBI watching you? They called us communists. Now, was that the J. Edgar Hoover? That's J. Edgar Hoover. COINTELPRO? Yeah, yeah. That's, he, he served all that time. Mm -mm. And he, he wants you to feel like, every, like I'm talking to you, you must be working for the Justice Department. He must be working. He, th that's in your mind because that's the way they worked it. You never knew who to trust. You never, that's what they, they, they undermine us with mistrust mm -hmm. because they use what's called the, the Willie Lynch letter. Mm -hmm. You ever read that? Yes. And that worked. And it really worked. Mm -hmm. So we had to work through all that to fight. And, and we still do. Yeah, and you have to, and you have to keep studying. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm studying now. When I, my family had a family union in, in uh, Houston, Texas, I went through where Southern, uh, Texas Southern is. All the houses are boarded up. Now, my family, we are middle class now. We're meeting all out in Spring, Texas, and Webster, Texas, and these nice air conditioned, laid out places, mm -hmm. lodges and stuff. Yes. And I said, if God, and she had a white man as our tour guide. I said, well, uh, you know, and he kept telling me, well, we don't want to go out third ward. We don't want to go out third. He said, well, where do y'all want to go? I said, the third ward. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And you can see, I can see in Houston, Dayton, Detroit. So Trump is talking about Baltimore. 
he's letting that cat out of the bag what the master plan is. That's why when Motley pointed out about that, that book, she, Motley? This brother here. Mike Motley? Mike Motley. One of the founders Talk, of Dayton yeah. Black Panthers, like right. the original Black yeah. Panthers, okay. The book, The destruct, Destruction of the Black Man. The structure, the organizer's plan has been has been going on. Black so civilization. You, read, you see it. You can see it evolving. Oh, destruction of the black civilization. That's right. That's the black civilization. When I said when we meet again, we'll have a map on the table and showing you Dayton. We'll have a section where the black people were. The, the program that I was over, I was the coordinator from LC. You draw a line on the map. Of 40,000 people in there. This is in 1968. Okay. There are about 3,500 people in there now. It went from 40? 40,000. To 3,500? 3, I mean, as we sit. Where we sit now, there were black people everywhere. They're gone. Destructive black civilization. So. I mean, there's a lot, right? We yeah, we could, oh, not, and we, good, we could talk will. forever. But I, one of the comments that I heard from you over the course of working on this elders reunion is that black people somehow sold out and gave up their p collective power. Can you just talk a little bit about what you mean by that in terms of black people selling out and giving up? The, the Kennedy administration set up what was called OEO, the Office of Economic Opportunity. They put money out. <clears throat> you could take and write a grant. Our local office was scope, supportive counsel and preventive efforts. A guy named Al Rosenberg, my wife, Minnie, and I, we are youngsters. We, had, we didn't even, hadn't even started a family yet. Mm. She got the job as research director her scope. So her, her job was to research the movement of black people. Okay? I'm in a community working with teaching at Edison School, walking across the street with the Dayton Alliance for Racial Equality, and the women separated from the Dayton Alliance for Racial Equality and formed their own group called the Black Emoja Society. Huh. Okay, now we split again. So that's what, so when Model Cities, which is the results of OEO, came, we had meetings just like we met uh, now. We're not going to have, have anything money. And I said, well, if we stick together, maybe we could control it. One half group said, we're not going to have anything to do with the money. I went with the money. That was, that was a mistake. It was a mistake? Yeah. We formed a nonprofit corporate, everybody talking about nonprofit, called the Model Cities Planning Council. I read a book on a man named Joseph Nye. He had, he had uh, they separated Tanzania from the British, British colonization, mm -hmm. and they formed parliament. And I saw how he, the parliamentary system where people are elected from precinct. And then they get together and they elect a leader. Well, that's why I lost control of my other cities then because they got together and they, I, my daddy told me, <clears throat> you don't know everything, you need to get Paul Prayer to help you. Paul Prayer was a disbarred an attorney and he always told me that when he was disbarred, they claimed that he represented communists, which he really didn't. Mm. He was drunk. He didn't show up for his cases. Oh. And they, 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 they disbarred him because he was negligent, okay? So Paul Prim became my assistant coordinator. A white man called me downtown named Talbert. You know Talbert Towers? You ever heard mm -hmm. of that? Tom Talbert called me down there. Boy, he cursed me out, and I said, this back was talking to me like this. No, no. He said, what you doing crying at Paul Prim? Well, Paul was brilliant, legally. He was just negligent in his personal life. Then Paul had me hire his brother, Roger Prim. He was an accountant. 
Paul was my assistant. He was a lawyer. Both of them did bar it, but every black person in the community, they didn't have no money, so they had Roger do their taxes for them. So Roger had clout with the grassroots. Mm. That was a model city. So when I showed him what the government had planned, he looked at me and he said, my goodness, that's one of them, this, that's one of them these giveaway programs here. Mm. And they're getting ready to do it again. They are, and that's why I'm very interested in knowing. Still, I, I, I think I, I have the question floating in my head, like why is the money a problem? Because people, even the Bible says, right, that yeah. money answers to all things. Yeah. So how does money become the problem if you are trying to change? Because we recently, we're coming up on the anniversary of John Crawford. We had John Crawford shot by the police at Walmart because a white man called and said that he was carrying around a gun that, right. you know, turned out to be a store, right. uh, you know, a uh, commodity. Um, we've had, you know, multiple incidents right. locally with still racial issues, right. um, highly segregated, right. West Dayton, right. downtown gentrified. So what is it that we need to know as the next generation about the money? Well, first thing, we have to be organized. Okay. You have to be unified. If you're organized and unified, you can control the money. But if you're not organized, they're going to pick you off one, one at a time. And that's the key thing. So confronting City Hall and you're not organized, it don't mean nothing. Now everybody want to write a grant. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, people want a job. I said, well, what do you want to do? Well, I want to do what you're doing. I said, you don't want a job. You just want to be on the payroll. Mm -mm. And that's basically what happens, see. But if you, that, that market that you're talking about, if the goal is to create a job, you be organized, that's your goal. I'm glad you brought that up. Because, yeah. I, and, and I know time's running long, and, and let's, let's make this the last one. Okay. So with the market, we have Gym City Market, 2,100 members. Right. And really national acclaim in terms of the growth of our market. We've raised close to $5 million. We've actually completed our capital campaign. One of the major challenges is galvanizing the support of the Christian leaders and the black church. Yeah. What is it that you would suggest we do next in terms of engaging the black church for a unified power move? Yeah, well, that's, see, that's, I am a work in progress because when I became president of NAACP, mm -hmm. Jesse, wanted me to get involved with the NAACP because he was getting old. Jesse Gooding? Gooding. Okay. So I said, okay. So he tricked me. Me and uh, the, uh, the guy who, I just, we mentioned his name about SCLC, Dave Gilbert. Okay. We went down to Reverend, the county. Reverend, right? Reverend? Reverend David Gilbert. He was head of N SCLC. And we went down to the county and, and we looked at who was hired down there. And, we, and they, I get down there, they got cameras everywhere. Well, I'm working for the city, for uh, the Human Relations Council, mm -hmm. running this a program that Mr. Motley was in at that time. And I'm not supposed to be down there picking. Mm -hmm. So Joe Steele, <laughs> <laughs> Joe Steele is my boss. What you doing on television? Mm -hmm. This really split a lot of people. So Jesse tricked me. So I mm -hmm. said, well, he said, I'm going to make you president. He did that about five times. I said, this thing ain't going to make me president. <laughs> I'm about to run on my own. <laughs> so, anyway, my point, I'm going to get right to the ministry right quick. So yes. I said, well, How do I get them together? When we, what we really need is a black church behind us. Right. So I had organized the ministry. I fed them breakfast. I used to have a breakfast meeting with them. Yeah. Them Negroes cut my throat. Next election came up. Uh, they decided to run their own man, got him banged. And my, my neighbor, Reverend Harris, lived right across. I, I watched his boys keep him from, they out there playing in the street. And I said, right. get back, you know, when he's waiting on the bus, watch him growing up. I said, I know this Reverend has got my back. He said, man, I got to take care of my brother. I said, wow. And I talked to another, I said, these preachers are something. But collectively, they stay, they galvanized, they just galvanized against you. They galvanized against me because I was okay. pushing them 
They galvanized, yeah. <laughs> the tech the, the NAACP. And once they took it, I had lunch with, uh, with uh, Banks, and I said, okay, you got it, man. I, I work with you. He said, where's the money? Just like the little girls with you. How much money we got? You know, I said, man, no money. We, I volunteered to do this. He said, volunteer? Hell, I'm out of here. <laughs> he stayed one term. So I'm saying, you have to organize. You can't rely on those preachers. They're the first one to cut your throat. For the money. <laughs> For the money. And, and it's really nickels and dimes. They used to come around to the churches. When I was running for office, they were a, 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 a guy running for office, he just come around the church, have a hundred dollar bill and stuff, and look up at the price, he goes, lay it in there, and next thing you know, the church is backing him. Ed Orlett was my nemesis, a guy, a white guy in Dayton View, who, you know, he was, he was the state representative. Mm -hmm. C.J. wanted me to run against him because Orlett got tired of voting. C.J. would be doing other things, and they had a little thing where you click, oh, that was vote him, vote him up there in the state house, you know. And so C.J. was out with him, so C.J. paid me to run against him. Wow. See what I'm saying about the money? Did you win? No. In 1980, no. I wasted, I took $15,000 out of my bank account. And you know what happened? The speaker, the Democratic Party head was a man named, uh, I can't, can't think of his name, but they got a burn right. Hmm. Burn Rice, when they saw I was winning, and uh, they gave him $25,000. I said, what happened? I, I, me and CJ would just talk. I said, what happened, man? How'd he get all that money? He said, well, Coke gave it to him. Mm. Coke was the Council on Preventive, it's, no, it's the, uh, it's the labor organization. Okay. So they put that money in there, and I had all my people with old cars taking people to the pole. They had brand new front funeral home limousines and stuff. I said, boy, it was a that, rough money, campaign. Boy, that money, so you have to be organized. Okay. You have to be organized. That's well, the key. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you taking All this right. time. All right. And I appreciate you. I appreciate your work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because we don't have enough young people who are interested in that aspect of what happened just before you guys came. And you, the fact that we're doing it at Central State West Campus, this should be like the research hub. I agree. In West Dayton. Yeah.